which contains the analog digital converter, digital analog converter, to actually um, interface between the digital domain on the left hand side and the analog domain on the right hand side. Um, here we have the RF transceiver, mixer, VCO, PLL. That's the device that converts the analog baseband signal that we have here. It converts it up into the respective frequency bands for GSM 900 megahertz or DCS, uh, PCS 1800, 1900 megahertz and so on. We have a power amplifier here that amplifies the signal when we transmit and we have an antenna switch because there's only a single antenna and it, in, in this case it's a, uh, this is a uh, three uh, tri to quad band design here. You see the antenna switch has to switch between two different transmit paths depending on the frequency and three different receive paths again depending on the frequency. Um, we have a couple of more signals between them, but that's, uh, if you want to read more about that, I've written a paper on uh, um, the telephone anatomy, and uh, you, can, you can read more about the details, how this works together, um, this entire beast. So, what do, we want to, wh what do we need in order to achieve what we want, the, the Ethernet card for GSM? We need the baseband chipset under our control, we need the layer 1, we need the layer 2, we need the layer 3. All of them need to be open source, so we can modify them and so on. None of the components existed, so we had to start. Um, there's a couple of different approaches you can do this. One of them is, well, you use documented standard off-the-shelf components and do everything from scratch. So you use a CPU that's publicly available, that's publicly documented. Use a DSP that's publicly documented. You write all the code. Use an FPGA for the, for the synchronous time-controlled uh, 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 signals in GSM. Um, which means you don't need reverse engineering. You, uh, however, need a lot of work in the hardware and, and digital logic design and analog, logic de uh, analog design. Um, and in the end, you will end up with something which will be very expensive because it's low quantity. It's a very special purpose device. It's not a neat telephone or something like that. However, as I said, you don't need any secret information. You don't need any reverse engineering. Now, the other option is you can build a board yourself by using existing baseband chipsets. Now, I just previously mentioned that you cannot just go somewhere and buy them. Well, luckily, there, are, there is the gray market for semiconductors, where fab factories in China that, ha that didn't actually, I mean, they order 100,000 components, and then they only use 90,000. So what do we do? They do with the remaining 10,000. They put it up for auctions in the gray, gray market. So you can, you can buy uh, uh, lots of components that are not generally available from these uh, gray market uh, uh, traders. Um, that uh, trade in, in uh, surplus semiconductors. Um, it's an entire industry in itself. Now, um, and it's quite amazing. I mean, I did this for the Calypso in the beginning when we started, and um, I put in an interest. You can say, well, I'm interested in this or that component, and I never had that many emails in my inbox ever before on a single day. So <laughs> hundreds of Chinese companies trying to sell me this chip. Um, for something like, I don't know, two dollars each or something, right? It's not that they would earn a lot of money with this, but it uh, works. I, I wanted ten, by the way, yeah? Ten. <laughs> <laughs> so, mm. yeah, so you can build some hardware, but yeah, it's still custom hardware. You still need, well, you need reverse engineering because, well, you get the chip, but you don't know how it works. Um, and yeah, custom hardware is still low quantity. So the lazy approach that we took, luckily, um, we found an existing mobile phone that we could repurpose where, well, we know the hardware is working, we know all the analog and digital design is working, otherwise the regular phone wouldn't work. Um, we don't need hardware prototyping, we don't need to do revisions, um, we don't need to do that much, um, well, if you can get the schematics with so many phones you can find as part of service manuals and so on, the amount of reverse engineering on the, on the circuit board level is relatively limited. However, still the reverse engineering related to the actual component, the baseband processor and, and the other peripherals is still there. Um, but in the end you can focus more of your time to the actual protocol software um, as opposed to, you know, doing hardware design and, you know, sourcing components and going to a prototype shop and spending a lot of money on yeah, and again, you're making a small mistake somewhere. So, yeah, by searching for suitable phones, there's a couple of criteria, right? We want a phone that's as cheap as possible because, well, we might break a couple of them in the process. Uh, it should be readily available, which means many people can play with it. If you do something like this with a phone where you have the single remaining unit in the market left, then, well, yeah, you can do it and you can be happy that you did it, but where's the point if nobody else can use the result of your work? So, you want to use a phone that everyone who's interested in the subject can still buy and can play with the open source software that you create. 
Um, and of course, you want to use a baseband chipset where a lot of information is known that shouldn't be known. And the result of this was we went for the Texas Instruments Calypso chipset, where the digital baseband documentation uh, interestingly appeared on Cryptome quite a number of years ago already. Uh, the analog baseband documentation you can find on Chinese telephone developer websites, which are a very, very useful resource, by the way. Stuff like 50, 52RD, BBS, and, and other sites are uh, a real fountain of, of uh, wealth of, of information. Um, the source code of a GSM stack that ran on a very strange telephone design based on that chipset was on SourceForge for four years and nobody ever really, you know, TI never took it down. Uh, of course, it was not legitimately on source first, right? Um, so after I made my first presentation, it was taken away from source first, but uh, of course, there are many copies around, you know, the internet doesn't forget. Um, also, well, um, the telephones uh, are end of life, the chipset is end of life, but uh, you can still, until 2008, you can still, you could, you could have still bought phones with that chipset. That means only two years ago, there are lots of phones that are still somewhere in a stock or secondhand market is still very large. The other chipset we've started to look at is MediaTek chipsets, where MediaTek is a Taiwanese company that uh, is shipping 95 million uh, baseband chipsets a quarter right now. Um, it's a very high volume. They basically own the, the low-end uh, GSM phone market today. Um, and uh, yeah, you can find SDKs, you can find documentation and so on, and that's uh, going to be the not next target. But for the first target, we chose the TI Calypso because more information was available at that time. We start in January, which is, by the way, 12 months ago, not nine. I should just remove that. Um, and uh, yeah, we implement the, the baseband software from scratch. That means protocol stack, hardware drivers. We also want to do some user interface. We don't really have it on the phone yet. Uh, however, we have a verbose user interface on the PC that many people will like because it's modeled after a Cisco-style uh, telnet interface. We have, you know, <laughs> tab completion and everything. Um, so the name, by the way, is Open Source Mobile Communications Baseband. Um, right, so the, no questions about that. Um, the software architecture, well, we reuse code from OpenBSC whenever possible. I mean, after all, we already have an open source implementation for the network side of the protocol stack. Um, so we split the generic part into a library called libosmo core, the open source mobile core library, um, which we use both for the telephone side and for the network side of uh, the GSM uh, stack. And we run as little as possible, a little software as possible in the phone um, uh, because, well, debugging code on the PC is much easier, right? If you want to do debugging of some embedded stuff running in an ARM microcontroller, JTAG and all that stuff, and you always need to download your new code, and it's, it's just not as convenient as debugging it on the PC where you can just run it on Valgrind or you can, you can do whatever you want. Um, you have more screen real estate, right? It's an important factor in debugging something. So what we do now is that we do, of course, the hardware drivers have to run in the phone. Um, we also run the layer one, which is the time synchronous, very timing critical real time part of the GSM stack that runs also in the phone. But layers two and layer three and everything above that runs, so far runs on the PC, which makes, as I said, things much easier for you. Of course, it's written in a way that we can easily move the layer two and layer three into the phone at some later point uh, when we want to create something that uh, doesn't require a PC attached to the phone all the time. We have a couple of interfaces. Uh, there's an interface between the layer one on the phone and the layer two on the PC. It's called layer one control. It's completely custom. There's no specification how to do something like that in the GSM specification. It's a message-based protocol using a HDLC-like la layer on over RS-232 that goes to the telephone. Um, then we have the layer two code that exposes an interface called RSLMS. If anyone has ever heard of RSL, it's the radio signaling link that's used in the core, well, no, in the radio access network, but the network side of GSM. We modified it to be able to use it on the telephone side as well. It doesn't really fit 100%, but 90% uh, at least. The firmware, so we, we cross compile a firmware that contains the layer one, it contains um, NOR drivers, LCD drivers, drivers for the hardware, all that. We compile it, we cross compile it, and we install it onto the actual device. And we will show how that works in, in just uh, a very short time. Um, there are some, uh, well, uh, layer 23 is how we call the, the sum of all the host software programs. Uh, that con that contains, well, layer 23 is layer 2 and layer 3, and layer 23 is a good number, so that's why it's called layer 23. 
Um, and uh, it, it uses this layer one control API to control the layer one on the phone, and it implements, as I said, layer two, layer three, cell reselection, SIM card. We can access real SIM cards. We can also emulate SIM cards. Um, and we have a support for various apps, and we'll, we'll talk about those apps um, in a minute. Now, the hardware, let me just briefly talk about the hardware before we can go into the demo and, and uh, the actual applications. The hardware that we support, once again, it's the TI Calypso Yota Rita chipset. Um, if, well, most people don't know, you know, how can I buy a phone with that chipset? The phones that you can buy are called Motorola C100. 110 something, like, you know, 115, 16, 17, 18, 120, 21, 22, 23, and so on and so on. I don't know why they have so many different models. They just differ in, in you know, the mechanical design or some, some minor feature here or there. But fundamentally, it's all the same. Um, most of our development and testing is uh, done on the C123 and C155 phones. And by the way, also the GSM modem in the OpenMoco uh, telephones uh, has the same chipset, and somebody has uh, ported it to make work, to, to, well, port. You don't need, really need to port much, but somebody has made it run also on those phones. If you look at a, a PCB of such a phone uh, and you remove the shielding covers, it looks a bit like this. You have the actual Calypso, the digital baseband chip down here. It's typically the largest chip in the device. Next to it, we have RAM and flash. Um, this is static RAM, it's SRAM, and it's NOR flash. So there's no NAND flash, no DRAM, you know, no refresh, cy uh, refresh cycles or anything like that. Um, it's all very, how can I say, low-end deterministic. The CPU doesn't have any caches. The RAM is driven without any wait cycles. You, you deterministically can tell how long an instruction will take so you can make sure everything will fit within the tight timing margins of, of the TDMA system that GSM is. This is the analog baseband chip over here. Um, we have a SIM card socket. Well, uh, this is the transceiver chip um, that up-converts from the baseband into the RF band and down-converts um, this is the antenna, or the RF power amplifier, and left of it the antenna switch module, and this is where the antenna connects to. Um, also see a battery connector, you see a vibrator connector, you see a headset connector, a buzzer, and so on. This phone does not have a USB interface or anything like that. It's a very, very simple phone. So how do we install code on a telephone? You, you plug a 2.5 millimeter audio jack into the audio socket, and you download it over RS-232 into the audio socket. That's, that's the official, <laughs> this is the official way how all these telephones have been built at that time. It's the official way how they do factory uh, flashing of the software and, and calibration and so on. It all goes through the earphone jack because, well, you can't do it over the power jack, can you? The other thing that you have is the earphone jack. So there's actually a, a GPIO line that you can toggle, and this line determines whether it's analog headset or whether it's digital RS-232 uh, serial line. Now, what do we have working? We have the hardware drivers, we have the layer one, doing power management, doing carrier synchronization, bit synchronization, TDMA frame synchronization, receive and transmit of bursts, various different bursts. We do automatic gain control, frequency hopping, encryption is not on the slide yet. We have the layer two, we have the layer three, and we have cell reselection. Um, so basically, we have a full phone. There are some things that are missing. Um, uh, it can also, of course, do phone calls, right, and SMS. Um, it has full rate and EFR codec, um, different assignment schemes. We do a SIM card interface, authentication with that. Some things it cannot do. Uh, we don't do in neighbor cell measurements yet, uh, which also means we don't do handover yet. So you cannot really move around using an, while you have an active call with Osmocom BB. That's sort of the, the only practical constraint, that, uh, the most important practical constraint. We don't have a user interface on the phone, but well, if somebody wants to do it. Um, uh, there are no circuit switch data calls, there's no GPRS, and of course there's no type approval, but that's not really something we're aiming for anyway. So, um, you can establish control channels and signaling channels and so on uh, to both hopping and non-hopping and encrypted and non-encrypted cells, and you can send them random messages and, and do whatever you want. We have control over the synthesizer, and we can, this is a regular GSM telephone meant for commercial GSM networks, but because we have control over the synthesizer, we can adjust the frequency and go into the railway GSM network. Um, there's no restriction in the hardware that prevents you from doing so, so you just tune it a couple of, you know, it's actually two or four megahertz lower than the regular GSM band, and there you go, and you receive uh, DB Systel, uh, Deutsche Bahn, uh, here in, in Berlin. Um, 
And uh, well, we can send arbitrary messages. We have traffic channel voice calls and so on. Um, Steve will be doing a couple of demos about 